Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Dear viewers, welcome back after the break. We were talking about our youth engagement with mosque. Alhamdulillah, it was amazing to know there are a lot of projects in DCO. Alhamdulillah, and they're achieving their excellence as well. So in our show, we have Falah Noor, mashallah, he's a young man. He's from, he done his madrasha, and now, mashallah, he's in Kirima University. Uh, Falah, tell me about yourself, sir. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, my name is Falah. Um, so I went to secondary school. Uh, Islamic secondary school halfway through my secondary and then now I'm studying biology second year at Queen Mary University. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. In, in Madrasha what did you achieve? Are you uh, Hafiz? Or uh, you well I finished my Hafiz Madrasha plus Maktab so half half and just did GCSE there. Went to a college in Stratford and then now I'm Queen Mary University. Alhamdulillah. What do you want to do? What's your study um, ending to? Well I'm quite interested, well I do biology because I'm really interested in it. But in that field, I want to go into more ecology kind of based. So in the beginning, I wanted to kind of be a teacher like two years ago. I was like, yeah, I want to be a teacher. But that's kind of like gone out of my system. Now I want to like go for what I really want, which is something ecology based, something with animals and plants. Although that sounds boring, I like it. Um, and you shall let's see what happens. Alhamdulillah. So how you link with DCO? Do, uh, do you have a specific role in DCO? Well, I'm, well, I coordinate youth work activities. So this March we started um, a youth club at DCO Masjid um, with one of our other uncles as well who was involved. And the reason why we did this is because about 10 years ago in our area of Docklands there was a lot of like those circles and see her's reminders for the youth but then suddenly that just stopped. So since that stopped the benefit is in there and we realise that the youth, our Docklands area has been lacking with youth activities. Mm -hmm. So the youth don't come to the Masjid much. Um, they don't have something fun. So we started a youth club in Diso Masjid um, just to try and bring the youth back to the deen, back to Islam. But we try and combine it with fun things. So we don't want to keep Islam as something boring. So in our youth club we have like pool, snooker, or same thing, pool, table tennis, ta table football, cram board. Uh, we give refreshments. And at the same time we also have like a short reminder every week at that time. And a lot of kids do enjoy it. Is that in the mosque? Are you doing yeah, the prayer it's in place? The mosque, yeah. Wow. So we have um, we have like a, the mosque is quite like um, purpose built. So there's room for praying. There's another extra room for different things, different classes. So we have this room. It's in a mosque, but it's got a lot of like fun activities. So it's, it's, it's a separate hall, basically. Yeah, a separate hall. Mashallah, man. Who who got this idea in your head? I mean, did you do it or the? Well, the, I think DCO have uh, DCO. They, I think they started. Uh, they started like they had the idea. But then they came to a few of us brothers asking like, do you want to help set it up or run it? So we're like, yeah, we really need this. We think it's really beneficial for the youth. So you're a Hafiz, right? Yeah, Alhamdulillah. Why is it in some other mosques we see, there are brilliant mosques around, but they don't have, ex don't have access to this kind of stuff. Why is that? Is that Islamic or un-Islamic? Um, I think one of the reasons is probably they don't see the importance of how we can bring in the youth through fun things. Usually they think you could just do nasihas, lectures, like constant like speech just to make it to get them to the deen. We also have to remember that Islam is not meant to be boring, it's meant to be fun. So mm. uh, and the facilities they probably don't lack as well. Like Adish, Alhamdulillah, they're very, very active in terms of the um, classes, the courses they do is very diverse and they've given us the opportunity to do it because they've already had the equipment, they had the um, games, activities, they had the people there. So that's why I think it's really good about DCO. No, but some people will say yeah. It's a waste of time. You're wasting your time. You could have done your Quran. You could have done it memorized in that time. Yeah. Why are they playing? What's going on here? This is more like a field of... Some people will say that. Mm -hmm. But they're missing a point here, actually. Yeah. I think th th Allah has designed us in such a way that we are not just like one type or in that one frame of mind throughout, the, throughout our lives or throughout every uh, part of our lives. So. Usually, and it is advised, even in some hadith, I can't remember what the, what the, uh, the uh, source is, but that I think that it's divided into seven year portions. So first seven years should be more of play and enjoyment for the children, because through the playing, they're learning. Mm. They're learning actually more than, it's not just a game that you just sort of put, you know, uh, brush aside and say, okay, this is just play, nothing more. But through that playing, they're actually learning how to, for example, um, accept defeat if they lost a game, or how to congratulate someone who has won a game, had, had beaten them, or how to share in that realm, and how to interact with other people in, in, in those very competitive environments.
in, as, as games go, as we know. So I think in that sort of uh, situation, in those situations, children are almost challenged yeah. to, to keep upkeep a particular, especially in that mosque environment, uh, a, a particular way of behaving. And they know that they need to be able to uh, behave their best because they, they are here, not because as, as they are constantly reminded and advised, that because they're just they're doing this because this is just part of life, but they're doing this because they have a, an ultimate goal is to please Allah, and because they know that ultimate purpose of their life, whatever they do ultimately becomes a worship. So it isn't necessarily a mundane activity, but this is in fact part and parcel of life, which is rewardable if it's done correctly, and in, 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 in the view and in, in the, with the intention to please Allah ultimately. I just want to add on that uh, was Fala was saying, the different um, events and activities we do. Uh, we have a garden project, uh, horticulture projects. Our local volunteers, mainly um, y youth and um, young adult, they engaged in. Um, bear in mind, uh, the center we have based in Dockland Community Organization, Cultural and Educational Center, based in 111 to 113 Mellish Street in Docklands. That potter cabin in this size was uh, closed for three years from 2010 to 2013. So when we got this place from councils, um, we, the local community, we regenerated these whole sites, garden and horticulture projects, including the port of interior and exteriors. So Alhamdulillah, we received a few awards. Um, we received gold awards from uh, Muslim, um, from MAID. It's called MAID, uh, Muslim Ag um, Agency for Development of Education. They're mainly based on ecological stuff. Wow. We received an award from uh, Westminster Parliament, the Gold Award. Uh, another award we received uh, that was um, uh, made a difference in the community. And uh, Alhamdulillah, last March, the Hamlet Council um, awarded Dockland Community Organization is the best um, winner of the best community organizations from you know Sa Safer Neighborhood Board. Earlier on, I was talking about engaging with youth. So we have off the street campaign. So what we done, we engage with the local community, particularly um, teenagers and young adults. We engage with them, empower, and so that they can enrich themselves. And um, so uh, council does recognize this. Can I ask you how many young people are involved with this? It's about more than uh, more than hundreds. More than hundreds. Look at the look at the time yeah, you're but doing. But it. not only the boys, also that we have girls group. That's good to know. Mashallah. The girls group, women group, our mothers and grandmothers group we have, uh, black and minority ethnic. Not only Bangladeshi origins, we have Somalian Arabs. origins, we have Mashallah. Eastern European origin, Algerian, Moroccans, um, uh, the w white community as well as. So uh, this center, uh, Islamic center, is access to all. Uh, the way we designed it is uh, multi-purpose. But Mahutba, you know, like, I know it's, it's, the, it's the gardening and all that stuff, but mm. what you've done, 100 people coming together from different generations, different ages, and the bonded, that, that's, the, that's the beauty of it, the bonding between them, mm. and the respect you will create from that, and the trust. Right. These people will never forget the people who they work with, the older ones. Yeah. It doesn't happen just like, Khalid Namaz Fulu Masud is enough. No, it doesn't happen like that. You have to do things together. Right. Uh, not only the Muslim community, we engage with them. We have been engaging with our neighbor, the Christian community, since 2004. Um, when um, St. Luke's Church, um, they needed planning permissions. So we Muslim community, we supported it. We done petitions. We even traveled to um, council chamber that day, uh, the, the planning, uh, planning committee meetings. We supported it. And then um, they got the planning permission. Now they are building it. The new church will be built. Oh, so the Interfaith Week, uh, Ministry of uh, I think Interfaith uh, uh, Religious Affairs, they, they visited us back in 2011. And um, he was surprised to see that under one roof that time, the Muslim community we are praying and the Christian community in the next door. So also uh, uh, it happened in the Ramadan time that time. Uh, it was a Lent for uh, Christians community and we had our iftar. So we we then took it together. We, 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 yeah, a lot, of, lot of achievement. Yeah. Lot of achievement. Can I go to the young man? I come back to you because yeah. he's got a lot of he's got a list of things. Man. <laughs> Mashallah, good. Um, when you were studying in Madrasha, yeah. and now you're in university, do you see the differences or environmental difference? Did you find difficult to adjust 
to the environment? It's, it's, there, there are a lot of differences between Islamic school and the uh, university. Um, one of the main things is that in Islamic school you have a much more, um, more connection and contact with your teachers. So your teachers know your strength, they know your weaknesses, they know what you're good at, what you're not good at. But in university you have like 100 or 50, 150 or 200 people in one lecture hall. And then you don't know your teachers as well as you knew your teachers in secondary, so you don't have that connection with them. So in you university, don't have the personal connection? Yeah, you don't have that personal connection as much okay. in university. So you're expected to be more independent in university, which is good in a way, it makes us more independent. Uh, but in secondary school, it's more like kind of spoon-fed you what you need to, you need to do this homework by then. In university, you need to be more independent. Uh, another thing is uh, in university, uh, well in Islamic secondary school, it's just full of Muslims. So it's good because like the Muslim environment was very strong, very solid. Obviously, you have people being naughty, bullying and all that. But the Muslim environment was really good. You're around brothers, people who remind you of Allah. In university, you get to mix with so many other people. So Muslims and non-Muslims. Uh, but the added benefit of that is that you can also, by interacting with non-Muslims, you can be a form of dawah as well. So they learn a thing you or two about You mentioned bullying. Islam. Do you get that in Islamic schools? Yeah, you do. You definitely do. Like people think Islamic schools are like madrasha, becoming like messabs and all that. But no, there are a lot of like people who go from Islamic school, they might have got kicked out because of, or expelled because of being naughty or being bull bullying or stuff like that. So it's oh, very common. That's kids, man. That's a normal yeah, human exactly. beings. They can be, wherever they go, they can be still the same. Yeah. But bullying, uh, is it really, because one of the young men actually, he killed himself, isn't it, last yeah. three months ago. It's, it's really, really, really dangerous. And in Islam, mm. it's, it's, f it's never allowed. It's yeah. dangerous, man. You'll be punished if you do that. So when you see bullying, that culture, do you think it's, it's a big culture? In, in Islamic school, I'm talking about specifically. It's in Islamic school, I didn't see or as much. Or innocently goes in that line. Well, it's, it's kind of subtle, but in terms of, I always went to state school from year 79. So first half of my second year in state school. I could tell there's a lot more bullying in state school than there was in Islamic school. Islamic school is a bit I more I remember strange. when I used to go to school, I mean, uh, Fora, yeah. we used to bully a lot. Yeah. 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 The normal thing is that we do so much, yeah, that's... Yeah, that's common, that's a lot that's, of bullying. Uh, yeah, but unless it's, if it's harmful, nowadays it's becoming very harmful, isn't it? They yeah. go on your Facebook, they go and do this thing, yeah. and they go do that. And a lot of young people are f affected. Yeah. Lots of, yeah. 35 million people have been affected by bullying. Mm -hmm. that, there was a report recently happened. So it's a big, big number. People get affected easily. I think this, is, uh, this, this brings me to this, uh, this other point about you mentioned earlier. You asked me about the difference between the masajid, the mosques in the UK mm -hmm. and, the, and, and those in the Middle East or say, Alhamdulillah. namely Egypt. Because you, you remembered. See, <laughs> yes. The, the thing is, um, and, and this would again uh, answer some of the questions which have just been posed by Falah here about how uh, oh, the, the, there is no, no, I believe that there is no such a thing as bullying from my experience or my children's experience in Egypt, for example, because there isn't such an environment where bullying, bullying can happen, for example. They are much more controlled environment, mm. number one. Um, at the same time, I think where everyone, where there's expats gone somewhere, they have common understanding between, the, between each other so, and the children, they've come, from, they've come with, the, with the parents for a purpose and they're quite clued up as to why they're here. And it's where you have, where like, they have, uh, they've, they've come here as in, uh, they've, come, they've gone there to, to learn, say for example, some Quran, some Arabic and, and some of the other things that they learn and a different environment, different culture. And this, is, this thing fascinates the young people and I think this helps them to grow intellectually as well as uh, uh, through experience, they're, they're far more richer in terms of the experience. So they come back and they can tell you many stories. This can happen if you take them to holidays as well. When they stay in a different environment, you find that their response is different, their mm. outlook in life is different, and they see poverty, they see people g go through a lot of hardship, and that also changes their, changes their perspective in life. So I think, fortunate or unfortunate, we've been sort of cocooned, we're like a bubble here. So I say in this, I, I always say this, that we are sort of in a bubble in this, this environment where our children don't get enough exposure to realities in the world mm -hmm. around them. And therefore they become that person which is, who is like home, uh, social media, PlayStation and, and their friends, you know. And that sort of closure or that sort of uh, closed environment in, in a sense 
doesn't make That's them. That's not reality at all, is it? The growth and creativity. Mm. They actually st stuns their creativity and their creativity and their growth. So I think it's. I feel it's advisable that parents sh should take the young children, young children, away uh, as much as they can, so that they can, uh, you know, feel and they can experience those things. Otherwise, they wouldn't they wouldn't experience in the environments that they live in? Education, Robert. Did you find any differences in Egypt and here, UK? Just in. I mean, there, 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 are, there, are, there are massive differences, of course. I mean, UK, it's sort of quite regimental. And you've got, you got to go to school on a certain hour of the day. No, I'm talking about back. madrashas. I mean, yeah. Islamic teaching oh, right. and, uh, and, and teaching yeah. in, in... Yes, in I think if you, if, you, if you throw your children in the deep end and just let them sort of, uh, f f you know, uh, let them grow in, that, in those environments where they can interact with people, indigenous population, children who speak only Arabic, for example, or only those languages, and the environment that they live in, all of those things has a bearing on that child's development. So it's not only about, you know, that, you know, the, the having a madrasa, you send them to an Islamic school in the evening. It's also the exposure to the environment and, and the social context that mm. they could experience living in a different country. Whereas here, it is very monoculture, you know. Yes, you have some flavors. Like and for some example, food. if I say, in, in, if you evening madrasa, so you they go and they learn uh, Haida, Quran, Tajweed, yeah. and the rulings, all that stuff. So when they go to Egypt madrasa, evening, yeah. I'm talking about, what would they do different or same? Well, what we had, we, we sent them to a school where they, it was day school. So they'll start very early in the morning. So it's like after Fajr, they'll start their mm. classes. So as a result, what happens is their brain works better in the morning and they'll learn much faster. So I, I felt that uh, my, my, my children were learning very, very quickly, picking up a lot of things that they'll pick up here in like three years, they'll pick that up in three months over there. Wow. The speed at which they would learn is much, much faster. Maybe and because you are too serious as well, you paid a lot of money and went there and to them to teach them, you are very focused on them? Yeah, they are private Could tuition, be, uh, they are. I mean, but at the same time, I see a lot of people who don't and they're just because the environment is so conducive to learning, the children do pick up very quickly and it's just so much better for them in terms of speed and, and, and retention as well. Fantastic. Um, we were talking about bullying. Mm. Bullying is, 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 is a disease, became a big, massive thing now. You know, a um, lot of young people's life are destroyed. And if they're not doing suicide, they're just destroying themselves, like they're isolated and crying, and you know, it's terrible. Um, does anything flick in your head? Why are we going to that route, or why is it really getting popular? Well, it's got to do with the environment they, they're exposed to. Um, the bullying culture has been there for centuries. It's not something new. The government has done lots of initiatives, safeguarding policies. Like the schools, madrasa, like this year we have a proper safeguarding policy. And we take it very seriously. Um, so, it is basically, um, it's, is, is the education, the curriculum they follow, I think the teacher needs to do lots of um, input into it, the parents. Okay, how would the parents notice that his son was, was or the daughter been bullied? What kind of, what symptoms do we need to look into? Because well, there are a lot of our viewers watching now, I mean yeah. they probably want to say, I don't know if my kid's been bullied, but how would they know if they've been bullied? It's, the parents must have a very good relationship with their children, every day or every week. They should follow what they are learning it. Is there any issue when they go to madrasa or schools? Have they exposed to anything? Uh, I mean, they must be, parents must be a good friend with their children. Um, they should be open to them. Mm. So imagine. And, and vice versa. Otherwise, there is no way because um, we know that sometimes when teenagers, they cut their yeah. um, arms, hands out of anxiety, stress. Okay, so maybe they're isolated, Isolate, they're in yeah. their room, they're not talking That's to nobody, right. yeah. they look worried, they're That's not looking right. out for themselves. If there's kind of stuff like that, then you need to yeah. look into it. Uh, although teacher um, in his schools, teacher, they do monitor these, but in, in madrasa, the evening, evening madrasa or weekend madrasa, and the teacher should be, the imam or uh, religious teacher should be trained properly for this. We do, we have these projects, mm -hmm. we do safeguarding training. Um, regular basis from councils, and um, and we do uh, we make sure the person who is running the centre 
uh, they do have they do uh, one to one basis to two teachers and the monitor even with the parents parents evening they do, uh, we have one to one uh, parents evening so we've got five minutes for another break. Um, can I ask you something, Noor? Um, yeah. You know, you're from, I'll keep coming to you because yeah, right. you've got two Paul and you've got Toki <laughs> on and you likely must have, you are must have, mashallah. Uh -huh. You know, we are grateful to you and, and the madrasha who teach you. Um, you know, like you've gone from Islamic madrasha. Yeah. Your morals, your behavior, your s expectation is totally different than a normal person who goes to university, right? Yeah. So people, when they look at you, so do you think or like you met the expectation? Um, uh, it's a wrong question to ask. But I mean, everyone's different. Like, I don't think everyone thinks if they go to Madisha, they're going to fulfill the expectation. Everyone comes out from Madisha with a different kind of outlook, with different personality. But I think Madisha life nurtures us to be like better Muslims. That's what I find. Yeah, because the, you've been trained to be a better Muslim, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's true. In Madrasha especially, to you have to smile, you can't swear, you can't do this. You, you can't do any of these things. Imagine you go into an environment, they're talking, everything is opposite, almost. Yeah. Then how do you behave in that position? Did you have a difficulty? In which position? When you went to university, oh, university. did you find it um, difficult? Not really, because like um, some of the things they teach in schools about manners and character, not bullying, they teach in Mother Russia as well, it's the same. But just like, because um, I went to state school as well, so I kind of like was around non-Muslim before that. So whatever I learned in Madrasa, whatever good like I learned, I just tried to implement it to what to my college and university. Okay, so when you said you met a lot of, um, uh, you got a lot of non-Muslim friends, non-Muslim teachers, did you, did you ha do you have access to talk to them about Islam? Are you allowed to do that or are you just on your own? Yeah, I mean, for university, they, uh, it seems more open, like y more open-minded. You could speak to anyone about whatever you want. So we had um, elect one of our advisors last year. He, he um, He's into evolution and that, so he was having a conversation with me about evolution, the Quranic aspect of it. So yeah, I did have one or two conversations, even one of my friends in one of my modules, like um, I went to Scotland with him for, for biology module, and he used to ask a few questions as well about Islam, this allowed, is that not allowed. So he, here and there you get to meet normals, you get to, like, they learn a thing or two ab about Islam from you. So it's, it's a nice experience, which, you, which I couldn't have actually done in my Islamic secondary school. There's an opportunity as well. Yeah, opportunities, yeah. societies. Do you fluently speak Bangla? Uh, can you write Bangla? I can write Bangladesh. I can write that. I could write other what do you simpler mean Bangladesh? stuff. I could write that. Okay. Bangladesh. Do you when you see the news <laughs> and right. okay. with Bangladesh, I, I could write that pretty nice. Um, I could write basic stuff, but like small, like curvy, too many well, curvy stuff, I don't know. That's great. Can you do it in the Arabic? I could write Arabic, like, because I study that, like, in Islamic school, but I've, in terms of speaking, I'm not very good at it. Okay, that's interesting. Maybe it's so when, when we speak uh, Shuddha Basha, Kemunas and Balawasani, do you seem to understand? Uh, yeah, a bit like that. Basic stuff like that, I, I, I understand. But if you go to like um, news channels and they talk about politics, uh, I don't understand anything. So I just ask my mom and my dad like... I mean, that's the, that's, no, but that's the reality, isn't it? Honestly, yeah. that's the reality of our, think, our uh, yeah. generation. This is one of the things that we are not going to have everything we that we want. Ideally, it would be good to have like all three languages and be fluent at those, you know, because then you can sit with someone uh, much older than you and have a conversation with them fluently in their, n their native language, like say Bangla, and they would feel that that child or that boy or that girl is speaking in a way that is just like them and that much more comfortable with them. So that is something I think we are largely losing. In in do you think it's scary? Do you think we should be something aware of like we're losing a generation of people, like my kids as well, they don't speak, they, they might understand <laughs> what I'm yeah. saying, but they don't, can't read, they can't write. I think it's, it's very just important. like identity loses, isn't it? it's just like we're moving yeah. away I th from I think it. I think it's very important that we hold on to our cultural and linguistic identity, mm. like, because our roots, because this is where we were, it wasn't an accident, it was Allah's decision that we were born into those families that we were. And we have certain languages that we use, our elders are comfortable to use, and those languages are part of us. Now, if we are going to lose that, we are losing a part mm -hmm. of our identity because, you know, as much as we are you know, becoming, in, uh, we're embracing the first world by being more proficient in English use and so forth, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it is progressive. Because I feel that progression is when you can retain your identity fully and then move forward 
and be able to uh, in, uh, interact and um, not to assimilate but integrate into society. With, uh, whereas assimilation would mean that you lose your identity. So I think in the way of losing identity would mean also losing a language. So it's very important that we try to retain some of our Mm -hmm. that identity, that side of identity of both by the language. Uh, okay, we just we're going to go to a small break and we'll come back. Okay. Again. Is that okay? Is um, Nur staying with us? Yeah. Hopefully. Mm -hmm. uh, do you everyone, we're just going to go for a small break. I do want to stop now, but we have to go a small break. I'll see you after the break, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. <laughs>